dancing like adults right now. We always do that. Here's the thing. You just sang a song that talked about building our life on Christ and nothing else. After the hurricane, I know everybody's tired of hearing about the hurricane, so am I. But the week after the hurricane, just about every church in Bay County sang that Build My Life song outside, sitting around awnings all across the county and all across the panhandle. Why? Because in that moment, when everybody was still shocked by what had happened a few days earlier, being a child of God, we just sang about, and having our lives built on Jesus Christ was about all we had in that moment. And then just as we got our feet back under us, just as life was going back to normal, just as some of you guys were getting back to your homes, COVID hit. And it again turned everything upside down. And over the last year, we've all lost stuff. I had a, a freshman in college standing by the door during the middle school service. She lost her graduation. She lost her prom. She lost her last day at school. In the midst of that, she lost her uncle who died of COVID. And we've all got stories like that. We're all carrying some sort of burden in our lives. It could be something COVID related. It could be you're still not back in your house. It could be that you're a senior and you don't know what the next step is and you're scared to death of what's going to happen after you walk out of your high school for the last time. It could be mom and dad at home and they're not doing well and you don't know if they're going to make it marriage-wise. It could be an uncle or a grandparent who's sick. It could be anything. It could be a relationship. Maybe things aren't working out with your coach. Maybe you got hurt and you're not getting to play. I don't know what it is. We all carry burdens. We all have secret sin. And for a minute, we're going to just sit here in silence. Sam's going to lead us in a prayer. And then we're just going to be quiet for a few minutes. You can sit. You can stand. You can come down here to this altar and bow down before an almighty holy God. But for a couple of minutes, we're just going to pour our hearts out to God. Is there a sin in your life that you need to give Him? Is there a hurt in your life you need to give Him? God is bigger than anything that we go through if we're a believer in Jesus Christ. So Sam's going to lead us in a short prayer, and then we're going to just get with Jesus. I don't want you talking. I don't want you on your phones. I just want you with Jesus. You want to come down the altar, come down the altar. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to sit, sit. If you want to go over up against the wall, go. I don't care. Just get with Jesus for a couple of minutes. And whatever is burdening you, whatever is on your mind, turn that over to Him for a few minutes. If you're good, pray for somebody else. Sam, would you lead us to the throne? Absolutely. All right, let's pray, guys. Father God, I just thank you for this uh, opportunity to, to have just an intimate moment with you, the God of the universe. Um, it's such a beautiful reality that you know, you're, you're just a thought away or a, or a, you know, a, a word away. Um, we have that opportunity to, to speak to you um, and tell you what's on our hearts, even though you already know it. <clears throat> Lord God, as, as we're just a few days after celebrating the resurrection of your son, I thank you for him. I thank you that you paid the price that we deserved for our sin.
hand, come down to the altar. Just pour your heart out to Christ. that are super stressed right now about life, about school. I pray for those that are carrying burdens that no one else can understand, God. I pray that your peace would be on them, that you would comfort them and help them to know that they can honor you and bring you glory through their difficult situation that they're in. God, I pray for those that are harboring like secret sin in their life. You would expose that between you and them and begin a healing process where they would turn that sin over to you. I pray for those that are struggling with self-confidence, that are struggling in friendship relationships. I pray for those that are somebody in this room of this size. I pray for the person that wonders if they were to disappear off the face of the earth and anyone would even know they were gone. And just reassure that person that they have value. Be with those that are struggling with school. Be with those that just are having a hard day. And work in our lives to build us into the people that you want us to be, that you died on the cross for us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys take a seat. Thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. One thing that the pandemic has caused everyone, everywhere, I don't care who you are, where you live, anything, nothing, nothing separates you from what I'm about to say, is that everyone has had to reevaluate, or there's been a couple things, everyone's had to reevaluate what's important in life over the last year. And every single person has had something that they were looking forward to ripped out, ripped away from them. Last year, it was the seniors. They didn't get a graduation. Well, a normal graduation. They didn't get prom. They didn't get their last day at school with their friends. They didn't get to walk out of school for the last time. We had students in this youth group lose family members, lose grandparents, and not be able to go to the funeral. Could you imagine that? Not being allowed to go to your grandfather's funeral. We've had people in this student ministry lose uncles and aunts to COVID. We've had people lose jobs. We've had people, it's been hard. But what it's done is it's made us ask what is important in life. And it's made us ask, 
Who are we? What is our purpose? And where do we find our peace? I mean, I know I have. Right? In the youth ministry world, I was at the, we were at the pinnacle, y'all. We were two months from rolling out of this parking lot with 240 people for summer camp. 240 people for summer camp. And in 10 minutes, it was gone. Some of you high school baseball players were literally getting ready to play a ball game when President Trump dropped the press conference with no groups of more than 50. And in a minute and a half press conference, boom, it was gone. Right? I was in a meeting, literally, we were in a meeting here with the staff looking at a, we were developing something that would have changed the ball game for this church. And in five minutes, we went from, how in the world do we do church when we can't gather in groups? How in the world do we do church in the middle of a pandemic that nobody knows actually how contagious this thing is? Like, what do we do? Like, who'd heard of Zoom? Anybody? I mean, come on, right? Who wants Zoom to go away forever? Me. It's not, you know, but, but life changed in an instant. And whether it's a pandemic or it's 10 years from now when you get the phone call that somebody's died unexpectedly or you're an adult, you, you're married, you've got a young family and you get the phone call that you've got cancer and it doesn't look good. There are all kinds of moments in life where we have to reevaluate and we have to go, what is important? And then we have to ask the question, who am I? What am I finding my identity in? What is my purpose on earth? And where do I find peace? And do I have any of that? Right? The last year has given us a chance to reevaluate everything. It's caused us all to make decisions that we didn't want to make. Right? It, but the good thing in all of this is that God is at work. People are getting saved. We've had multiple students get saved this semester. When I walked in here to start this service, my wife was walking through the plan of salvation with a middle school girl. That's awesome, y'all. God's at work in the midst of all of this craziness that we're going through. And every day we have to ask ourselves, God is at work in the world, but is he at work in our lives individually? Who is my identity in? Is my identity in my GPA? Is my identity in the person I'm dating? Is my identity in my school or what school I'm going to when I graduate high school? Is it in the, the, the athletic sport or band or dance team that I do my thing with? And what I found in life is what the Apostle Paul found is that when you find your identity in anything other than the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected King and Creator of the world, it will leave you wanting for more. Because nothing God created will ever fulfill you in the way that the Creator will. Does that make sense? You follow me? God created good stuff. Y'all know me. I'm obsessed with athletics. I'm obsessed with it. I love it. Like, I love to compete. When I was in high school, I loved one-on-one -on -one competition. Somebody won, somebody lost. It better be me winning. Right? I loved it. And I began to find my identity in Doug the athlete. I began to find my identity in my girlfriend at the time. I began to find my identity in whether or not I got a soccer scholarship. And then when I got that soccer scholarship, it was really cool, but it wasn't life-changing like I thought it was. That was fun, don't get me wrong. It was a blast. But it didn't give me the peace and the purpose that I thought I was going to get out of it. When I got my first job and started making money, it didn't bring me peace like I thought having money would. Just money, right? When I got married... Oh, that was awesome. I love being married. I love Carrie. But if she's my purpose, she's my identity, 
then it, it falls short. And we're going we're gonna to read a passage in Philippians right now where we're going to talk about Saul, or excuse me, Paul, who was in prison. And every day he would wake up not knowing if he would survive that day or if a Roman soldier would walk into his prison cell, grab him, take him out of his prison cell, take him to another part of the prison, put his neck down on a rock, and then proceed to cut his head off. Because that's how they did it. And every day he lived with that uncertainty. Every day he lived with the uncertainty or with the with the with that knowledge of being thrown in prison when he did nothing but proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was able to persevere through that because his identity was in Jesus, not something Jesus created. It wasn't in his name, it wasn't in his job, it wasn't in his friendships. His purpose, his peace. His identity was in nothing less than the blood and of Jesus Christ, the resurrected King that we celebrated this Sunday. And because his identity, his purpose, his peace, his hope was found in Jesus, Paul was able to overcome anything that the world threw at him in life. And that's how I've been able to overcome things that have been thrown at me in life, through my son's heart defect through the hurricane. And this wasn't my first hurricane, y'all. I did the one in New Orleans. Through disappointments of jobs not working out. Through disappointments of relationships not working out. The thing that has gotten me through all of that is Jesus. Nothing less, nothing more. Throw that verse up. Let's, let's walk through this. We're in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Paul is in prison. A man in prison for doing nothing wrong writes these words. And the thing you need to know about Paul, before he got saved, he was known as Saul. And he was a powerful man. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a young man that older men looked up to. Saul, before he got saved, had everything a human being could have at that point in life, in his in first century Palestine. He had fame, he had popularity, people looked up to him. When he walked into the room, everybody wanted to be, wanted to be seen next to him. Does that make sense? He was the guy. He was far and above his peers in the Pharisee world. He said he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. A, he had more zeal than anyone. He had more commitment to live in a righteous life than anyone. And what he found out was that no matter how righteous he was, he was never really truly righteous because he was a sinner, separated from God because of his sin. But then he got saved, and God changed his life, and God began to mold him in Acts chapter 9 and beyond. And Paul, and Paul began to be transformed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he became, his character became what God wanted it to be. So years later, now a mature disciple of Jesus Christ who's had his name changed from Saul to Paul, right, is now writing these words. He's also a man that had to deal with major sin in his past. Those of you that have read the Bible know that Saul was the chief orchestrator of the execution of Stephen early in the book of Acts, the first martyr. Paul, uh, Saul didn't throw the rocks that killed him, but he oversaw it. He might as well have. He persecuted Christians. He threw them in jail. He had them thrown in jail for no reason other than being a believer of Jesus Christ. Then in Acts 9, he gets saved. God changes his name from Saul to Paul, and he becomes the, the evangelist, the apostle to the Gentiles. And decades later, years later, after he has matured in his walk with Jesus, Jesus has transformed him. He is in prison, not knowing whether he would survive from one day to the next, not knowing when he would get out of prison, and having friends abandon him. Basically, everything's going wrong in Paul's life. And Paul says this. Now, I want you to know, my brothers, he's writing to the church at Philippi. Now, I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to the advance the gospel. He said, I'm in prison for no reason. I've done nothing wrong. The only thing I've done is proclaim Jesus, the saving power of Jesus Christ. The Romans didn't like it, so they threw me in this prison cell. But I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Verse 13. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 
So when he's in prison, he doesn't get bitter. He doesn't get angry. When life doesn't work out the way he wants it to work out, he doesn't throw a pity party. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't lash out. What he does is he says, I'm going to use this situation to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. And because he did that, everybody around him knew that he was in prison for Jesus and that he represented the risen king. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in change for Christ. Next, next slide. And because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident. Not only did people get saved, but the body of believers around him became more confident because they saw how he endured hardship and how he found his identity in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he couldn't, he couldn't find it anything else. He was in prison. He had nothing else. It was in Jesus. Because of my change, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Next. It is true that some preach Christ. Now, he kind of rambles here. He's a preacher. But it's true that some preach Christ out of rivalry and, uh, and envy, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely. Next slide. Supposing that they can stir up trouble. Number one, don't be a trouble stir. Don't stir, don't stir up trouble. Here is Paul in prison, and he's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's having to deal with some guys preaching the gospel, not to glorify God, but to put themselves on a platform so they can gain an audience and a following. And he goes, well, at the end of the day, they're preaching Jesus. But don't go stirring up trouble. We all know people that just go around stirring up trouble, right? Nobody likes them. Don't be that person. The world's got enough devil's advocates. We don't need any more, okay? That we got enough angry takes on social media. We don't need any more, right? We got enough lunchroom drama. We don't need any more, right? Don't stir up trouble. Be joyful. Be like Paul. For they stir up trouble for me while I was in chains. But what does it matter? Listen, even as they cause him trouble, he's like, I don't really care. The, the most important thing is that in every other way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. You see, he keeps, he keeps being, a, he's like happy. He's in prison and he's happy. It's like, I have to wait in line at my kid's school when I get mad. You know what I'm saying? It's like one of your parents like blocks me in in the parking lot at Mosley when you swim team people and I can't get out to go eat dinner with my family and I start getting mad. Why? Because I'm selfish. Right? It's like not that big of a deal. So rejoice. The important thing is that Christ is preached. Next, next slide. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. There's that word again. I know that through your prayers and God's provisions, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Next verse. So I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or my death. You catching Paul's attitude here? Are you seeing where his identity is? He's not talking about his job. He's not talking about his athletic team. He's not talking about a college team that you root for that none of them know who you are. Right? He's not talking about that. He's not talking about money. He's not talking about cars. He's not talking about, um, he's not talking about awards. He's not talking about any of that. Why? Because his attitude's in found. His, it's not his attitude. His identity is found in Jesus. And because his identity is found in Jesus, he has hope, he has peace, and he has a future in the midst of a chaotic and crazy time. We live in a chaotic and crazy time, do we not? Right? So I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient, listen, I love this, he said, sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. He's like, I pray that I would not get scared, that I would not get timid to live for Jesus in prison. Why did he say that? Because living for Jesus got him put in prison. It didn't get him a pat on the back. It got him beat and chained to a rock under the threat of death. Next slide. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, I will, it will mean 
mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which I know is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, listen to this attitude. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, through, listen, he's saying, I would rather be in prison, chained to a rock in a cold Roman jail, if it means you growing in your walk with Jesus, than to be released and you not grow in your walk with Jesus. That's wild, y'all. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. I think there's a couple more verses, right? This is it. And whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. Paul understood his identity was not found in this world. His hope was not found in this world. His peace was not found in this world. His future was not found in this world. Why? Because nothing in this world will provide that to the level that Jesus will. You can gain everything in this world and still go to bed with this emptiness deep inside of your heart. Why? It's because it's not what you were created to long for. It's not what you were created to worship. Why do so many athletes just bottom out after they get done playing? It's because that sport was their God. Why do so many business leaders, they, can't, they don't know what to do when they retire and they just end up dying? It's because the business was their God. Why do so many actors and actresses and musicians end up crashing and going into rehab and are married and divorced and married and divorced and married and divorced? It's because they're trying to find their identity in anything that's not God. They're trying to find it in popularity and in clubs and in money and houses and cars. You can't do it. Why? Because none of that stuff will fulfill you. But here is a man who did nothing wrong but was living the life in this moment like what we would consider most of us would rather die than do what he did. Right? I mean, nobody wants to go to prison, especially when he didn't do anything wrong. But when he's sitting in prison, what's he doing? He's praising God because him being in prison has allowed the gospel of Jesus Christ to be delivered to more people. Now, I'm not saying go share the gospel so you get put in prison. That's not what I'm saying. Don't go to jail. Jail's bad. Don't go, don't, don't go there. What I'm saying is, is can you rejoice when things don't work out right for you? Can you rejoice when you go through difficult times? Because no matter what goes on in your life, you have something better, and that's Jesus. I told the middle schoolers that when I was in seventh grade, some of you guys have heard this story. I was at a high school football game with all my buddies that I had grown up with. And all the middle schoolers sit on the home side in the top far right-hand section of the, of, the, of the stadium in the North City High School. And a bunch of my friends that I had grown up with, played ball with, done sleepovers with, all that stuff, didn't know I was sitting behind them, and they started making fun of me. And in a minute, my self-worth was destroyed. Some of y'all don't want to talk about it. But you've been there. My self-worth was destroyed. And that was when I was in seventh grade, and I'm 39, about to turn 40, and I can still remember what it felt like. And for the next four or five years, I went searching for who I was. I tried to find it in a girlfriend. I tried to find it in athletics. I tried to find it in, in a car. I tried to find it in anything that I could find it in. And no matter what I accomplished or what I gained, I would always go to bed that night and go, there's an emptiness inside of me. Just like, is this it? There's got to be more. It's the same feeling that Deion Sanders said after he won a Super Bowl. He was in the locker room and the reporters were asking him if he was going to go to Disney. And he said, man, I'm just trying to get over it. Win the Super Bowl wasn't what I thought it was going to be. He said, all they talk about is how awesome this is. But this is the best I'm going to feel after winning the Super Bowl? I don't get it, man. He was almost depressed. Why? Because it didn't fulfill him in the way he thought it would. Because... Only Jesus can. And so for the next four years after that, I was broken and 
hurting inside. I destroyed people around me to try to make myself feel better and to build myself up. And all I did was drive people away. All I did was make me a bad teammate. All I did was take a kid with pretty good athletic ability that was a pretty good ball player at soccer, and it just made nobody want to play with him. And I kept pushing and kept trying to find who I was in the stuff that I did. And it wasn't until I was at a church retreat, the sophomore, sophomore in high school, where I was with my girlfriend's church, and on Friday night, the pastor presented the gospel and said that because of sin, we cannot have a relationship with Jesus. And because of sin, we are separated from God, both here spiritually and forever in a real place called hell after we die. And that night it clicked when he said that Jesus came to heal the sin, to destroy the sin. Jesus came to make you reborn spiritually so that you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was that night I realized I had grown up in church, but I had never given my life to Jesus Christ. I had never asked Jesus Christ to, to forgive me of my sin and be my Lord and Savior. And it's that night at Ridgecrest, North Carolina, right outside of Asheville, in February, in freezing cold weather, that I got saved later that night, sitting on a kid's playground that just happened to be a replica of Noah's Ark. Okay, I, I was on the ramp, and I got saved that night at about 11 o'clock. Or so. And on that ramp, I said, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I know I'm separated from you. And I need you to forgive me of my sin and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. I need you to give me hope and I need you to give me a purpose and I need you to give me a future. And in that instant, Jesus changed me. And I just felt this peace come over me. There was nothing like I'd ever felt before. Now, that didn't fix my self-confidence issues. I had to work through that by reading my Bible and learning about what the Bible said about me and God's plans for human, human beings. But over time, God began to heal a lot of stuff in my life. That empty feeling went away. And it was filled with a purpose to live for Him and then later, when I, a few years later, when I was searching out God's will for me, for me as a career, I thought I was going to go do military, go into the army, jump out of airplanes, and blow stuff up. That's what, that's what I wanted to do. But then one night, about two, one, about, uh, about midnight, I was coming home from my restaurant job in December of my senior year, and God said, Doug, I want you to do youth ministry. I was like, me? I'm like a little short guy that can't sing. That's not what I do. I run footballs. I tackle people. I'm not real great at it, but I can do it, you know? I kick a little white ball around the field. That's what I do. I can't talk. I have a stutter. I can't sing. It's like I walk into a room and nobody knows I'm there because I'm so short. Like some of y'all walk into a room and everybody knows you're there. You know what I'm saying? You're tall. But me, I walk into a room, nobody knows I'm there, right? But he said, I want you to go into the ministry. And in a span of a couple years, I knew what God wanted me to do in, in my adulthood as a job. And I knew God's purpose for my life, which was to know Him. And knowing Jesus is what got me through Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. It's what got me through broken relationships in 2008 to 2011. It's what got me through my son being born with a heart defect and being told that there was a 3 in 10 chance that he wasn't going to live to be 6 months. It's what got me through Hurricane Michael. No, my house wasn't destroyed, but I had to watch all of my friends rebuild their houses. I had to help one of my best friends clean out his house when I could literally see the woods through the wall because the wall was no longer there. Right? And it's what got me through COVID and all the uncertainties that have come over the last year. And that relationship is what gets you through life as well. So Jesus says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord, you will be saved. The Bible says that we are separated from God because of our sin. 
but because Jesus died on the cross as a sinless man, when he died, he didn't die for his sin, but he died for our sin. And if we ask him to forgive us of our sin and be our Lord and Savior, when God looks at us, he sees the blood of his son Jesus that covers us and has forgiven us. He doesn't see the sin in our life. And I'm, not, I'm about to ask you a question. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you grew up in church. What I want to know is, has there been a time where you have asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin and to be the Lord and Savior of your life? He cannot be your identity. He cannot give you peace. He cannot give you a purpose until you get that part right. Jesus is not a genie in the bottle that's going to fix every issue in your life. Jesus is the, the genie in the body that fixes you. Because he spiritually rebirths you into a new spiritual being. And then he begins to mold you character-wise into who he wants you to be. He's not going to take away your... He's not going to make everything go away. He's going to allow... He's going to walk through it with you. So has there been a time where you asked Jesus to be your Lord and say, forgive you of your sin? I'm going to pray. And if you've never done that... Find an adult outside, find me, find Stephen Sims, and let's fix that tonight. If you are a Christian, where do you find in your identity? I'm going to pray, and then I've got one quick announcement. Father God, we love you. And I was kind of real tonight with me and something I went through in middle school. But it matters, because I think right now, in teenagers in Bay County, there's a lot of those questions being asked. And I know they're being asked because I know they're being asked by parents too. And as we begin to come out of this COVID thing, and we begin to figure out what the new normal is going to look like, help us to center ourselves on you. Help us to find our identity in you. For then, when we find our identity in you, it makes everything else we do that much more important. We're no longer just playing football to score touchdowns and to get our name in the paper. We're playing football to bring honor and glory to you. We're no longer dancing so that we can be the star of, of the recital. We're dancing so hopefully people see Jesus through our effort. We're not playing a trumpet or a clarinet anymore to try and get first chair. We're playing it to bring honor to you. We're no longer taking that AP class to just get into college. We're taking that AP class so that we can develop the mind that you've given us. See, when we find our identity in you, God, it doesn't mean we have to quit doing all the stuff we like, as long as it's not sinful. What it means is that it redirects how and why we do that, and it makes it that much more important for your kingdom because it becomes a platform to share with others what you've done inside our hearts. So God, be with these students as they finish school. I know they're stressed. They may not think they are, but the teachers are telling me they are. Their coaches are telling me they're stressed. Their principals are telling me they're stressed. But they're also telling me they're super proud of the teenagers in Bay County and how they have persevered. But God, let us not persevere on our own power. Let us persevere through you. Give us the same attitude, the same joy that you gave Paul when he was in prison. In your name we pray. Amen. Real quick, on April 28th, we will not, we're having the wreck, but we're not doing services. Throw that slide up. We're going to try something new. We're going to have fun. We're, we're just going to have fun. We're, we're, we're decking the parking lot out in the spring carnival. All right, we got we got snowballs coming. We're grilling hot dogs and hamburgers. Stephen Sims is bringing all kinds of games down from his farm. Um, we're gonna have fun. But hey, listen, listen. This is important. This is important. We're also gonna have the parent meeting for summer camp in this room at seven o'clock that night. So from six to eight, you guys are gonna be hanging out in the parking lot, playing games, having fun, all that fun stuff. Okay, eating snowballs. At seven is a parent meeting here. Listen. Listen, your paperwork, if you're going to camp, is due that night. It will be mailed out tomorrow. You should have it by Monday. Okay? I need that paperwork filled out, notarized, ready to go by the 28th that night. Okay? So we're going to be hanging out out there. 
And then uh, having fun, playing games, might even be some giveaways. Don't leave. Just saying. And, uh, but it's going to be awesome. So spread the word. That night, two hours outside having fun. All right? Um, Alex Chantilly speaking at Mosley's FCA tomorrow. Sam Dunyak, who's speaking at Bay Haven this week? North Bay this week? Eric Watson. Uh, Eric Watson. He's going to kill it. He'll do awesome. Eric Watson up at North Bay. Alex is up at Mosley. I don't know about the other schools. All right, let's pray. Father God, we love you. We ask that you would be with us and help us to have a great week. See you all next week. Amen. It's on, it's live.